nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. This disorder involves a hormone, and that hormone is known as ADH, also known as vasopressin. And when we talk about this, it's very important to first talk about ADH and what ADH actually does. ADH, known as antidiuretic hormone, a diuretic is something that makes you pee, so antidiuretic is the opposite. So let's draw a diagram here to illustrate this. And this is a diagram of the nephron, which is the unit component of the kidney. There's a million of them or more in the kidney. And ADH works on this part of the nephron, which is known as the collecting duct. And what ADH does is it brings back water into the bloodstream. So if you have a blood vessel, ADH will bring back water from the urine into the bloodstream and the urine will therefore be concentrated. The water, a lot of it has been brought back into the circulation. Now what happens in uh, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus NDI is the pituitary does release normal amounts of ADH but the kidney is unresponsive and that's the key right this from central diabetes insipidus whereas in central the uh, pituitary doesn't release adequate amounts of ADH in nephrogenic you do have a normal amount of ADH being released rather from the pituitary but the kidney is insensitive to the ADH so what happens is you essentially don't get this reabsorption. So instead of it coming back, the water just comes out into the urine. And as a result, you get a lot of urine, which is polyuria. And the urine will be dilute because there's so much water coming out. So now we can get into the symptoms. Uh, symptoms of uh, NDI, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, polyuria, where the, the, the patient uh, urinates a significant amount of uh, dilute urine. And of course the result is dehydration. And then also what happens is because water is not coming back into the bloodstream, you get a, a resultant uh, hypernatremia. And what that means is that because water is not coming back into the bloodstream, blood plasma is actually um, more concentrated. There's less water. So the plasma is more concentrated. So the signs and symptoms are, are lab tests. And this hypernatremia sometimes can lead to neurologic uh, symptoms. And that's important to keep in mind. So how do you diagnose this? A very important test known as the water deprivation test. After this test, uh, there's a second which is giving exogenous ADH. And I'll explain this with the diagram to help you understand. So let's start with the diagram to first uh, illustrate or explain the water deprivation test. So let's draw that uh, nephron again. And this is, of course, the collecting duct, this part. And in a normal person, when you have ADH uh, acting upon this collecting duct, water is coming back into the bloodstream. Let's draw a little blood vessel here and urine comes out here and let's give some numbers to make this come to life here urine osmolarity is uh, well normal is 500 to 800 so the normal and the normal plasma 
osmolarity, blood osmolarity, is about 285 to 295. So let's uh, say um, a person has uh, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, and they're peeing out a lot of, uh, uh, of water because the ADH that's being released by the pituitary, the kidney is unresponsive to. So what happens is this doesn't happen. The water doesn't come back. The water is just urinated out. So that means the urine water in it, so it would be very dilute. So if the urine is very dilute, the urine osmolarity will be, let's make up a number, it's very dilute, so um, let's say 300. Okay? Um, actually, let's go more dramatic than that. Let's just say 250. Okay. Now, similarly, because the, the plasma does not have the water, uh, the plasma will be more concentrated. So the plasma osmolarity will be more concentrated, so let's give it a number, uh, 315, let's say. It's a little more tightly regulated, as you can see, so I don't want to become too dramatic. Okay, so we have these numbers to play with. Now you give the water deprivation test. Now what's that all about? Basically, you're administering a test in which the patient is deprived of, of, of fluids and for about three to six hours, and then you measure these values again. Now normally, when a person is deprived of water, the body responds by producing ADH, and the body will bring back water to respond to the fact that, hey, we're not getting any water here, so we need to preserve the water, so let's release ADH and bring water back, and then the urine will be concentrated. But in nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, the water deprivation test has a very interesting result. Even if the body does respond by producing ADH, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, the kidney is unresponsive. So basically these numbers don't change. And that is a key distinguishing aspect uh, to this disease. This deprivation test is very, very important. So you have no change in this uh, urine osmolarity. Urine osmolarity, even with this de water deprivation test, uh, does not go up like you would expect. So that's that. So then what's the next thing that you do? The next thing that you do is you give ADH. To see if that's going to help. And in nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, there is no help there is no change because the kidney is unresponsive. Interestingly, when you give exogenous ADH, it does help central diabetes insipidus. And I made a video about that as well, and you can find that uh, video in, on our YouTube channel. So then finally, how do you treat this? ADH is not useful, so what do you do? Well, it's a very interesting treatment. Um, you actually give a thiazide diuretic, most commonly hydrochlorothiazide, and what this does, it has a paradoxical effect. It paradoxically reduces urine output, which is the opposite of what you'd think a diuretic would do, which is what thiazide and diuretics are. Diminish the water delivery to the ADH sensitive sites in the collecting tubules. Also put the patient on a low salt diet and the hope for this is that this will allow more more water to come back into the bloodstream and less water lost in the urine. So let's look at a couple of clinical vignettes to bring this to life. A patient complains of excessive thirst and urination. Lab tests show that serum osmolarity is 310 and urine osmolarity is 90. Plasma glucose is normal. Water deprivation fails to increase urine osmolarity. Subsequent injection of vasopressin also fails to increase urine osmolarity, which of the following is most likely diagnosis. 
Well, let's take a more careful look at this. The serum osmolarity is 310. Now the normal serum osmolarity is about 285 to 295. So this patient has a serum osmolarity that is higher than that. So that means they have a more concentrated serum. And then their urine osmolarity is 90. And normal is between 500 and 800. So their urine is very, very dilute. And that makes sense, right? Because if you remember uh, in that diagram that we keep drawing, in nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, the ADH is not working on the kidney, so water is not coming back. It's actually being urinated out, and that's why the urine is so dilute, and that's why the serum is so concentrated. Then you gave the water deprivation test, and that fails to increase urine osmolarity. Well, why is that? Well, because in a normal person, water deprivation would make the pituitary release more ADH. And that ADH would then go work on the kidney to bring back water into your bloodstream in response to water deprivation. Your body says, hey, look, we're not getting any water here. Let's bring back as much water as we can from the urine. But in uh, diabetes insipidus, the water deprivation test it doesn't uh, work. The uh, even if the pituitary releases the ADH, the kidney is unresponsive to the ADH. So then you give exogenous ADH, which is also known as vasopressin, and that also fails. Now, it would work in central diabetes insipidus because in central diabetes insipidus, the kidney does respond to the ADH. It's just the pituitary doesn't release adequate amounts. So if you give exo exogenous ADH, it will be fine. But in nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, even if you give the person ADH as an injection, the kidney is still unresponsive. So that's why it would not respond, and therefore the answer is B. And then one final one. A 24-year-old woman is involved in an automobile accident, sustaining a closed head injury and blunt abdominal trauma. She is admitted to the hospital and treated, uh, then released 15 days later. On the day she is released, serum sodium is 147, potassium 4.2, fasting serum glucose is 80, serum osmolality is 290, and urine osmolality is 85. Water deprivation fails to increase urine osmolarity. Measurement of which of the following differentiate nephrogenic diabetes insipidus from neurogenic diabetes insipidus. Okay, well she had a closed end head injury, so maybe something happened in the pituitary gland. And now she's got this scenario where the serum osmolarity is 290. Now if you recall, norm, normal serum osmolarity is between 285 and 295, so that seems to be okay. But the urine osmolality is 85. And uh, the normal is between 500 and 800. So clearly very dilute urine. So why does she have this very dilute urine? We're trying to investigate. So we gave the water deprivation test, and there's no response. Now, why is there no response? Well, because if she has central diabetes insipidus, the pituitary just doesn't release the ADH. If she has nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, the pituitary does release the ADH, but the kidney is unresponsive. So in both f forms of diabetes insipidus, the water deprivation test will not uh, make any uh, effect. So then you move on to the next test. And do you remember what that next test is? That next test is giving exogenous ADH. So you have to give an ADH. Another name word for ADH is vasopressin. And after you give the vasopressin, you then have to measure their urine osmolality. In central diabetes insipidus, there will be a marked change the urine will become 
more uh, concentrated. But in nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, there will be no change in the urine because the kidney is unresponsive. So to distinguish between nephrogenic and neurogenic, you have to give vasopressin and then measure urine osmolality.